Well, the nuclear active um, environment or the nuclear active metal it is a is a basic concept, and it's it's to designed to focus attention to a particular kind of viewpoint, because there are people who don't believe that it, some unique kind of material is at the at the center of this. They would want the whole material to be part of it. Now I'm saying, you know, let's let's identify something special and then look for that something special. And that so we have something to call it, we'll call it the nuclear reactive environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the characteristics of the nuclear reactive environment? Well we know a few of them. We know that you have to have deuterium or hydrogen in that environment. We know that the higher the concentration in that environment, the, the faster the reaction goes. We know that something in that environment is capable of hiding the Coulomb barrier of hydrogen or deuterium. We know that something in that environment also is able to communicate the energy to the lattice rather than have it go off as energetic particles. So, so we know just from the way in which it behaves certain overall characteristics, but we don't know the details yet. But when I say, okay, let's talk about the nuclear reactive environment, I'm saying let's talk about where those details are located in the material. Mm -hmm. Let's not scatter all over the place. Let's not look here, there, or there. Mm -hmm. We want to look where we expect that material to be located. I expect it to be located on the surface. Okay. The reason for that is that they have a higher surface area. So there's more real estate available for this reaction to occur. Well, that's where the, the atoms split, where the molecules split into atoms on the surface. On the surface. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. where all the action occurs. And so that's where you get your original reacting reactive. Well, it's all a matter of concentration. It doesn't matter in terms of absolute amount. It's determined by the concentration. How many atoms of hydrogen per atom of nickel okay. is there? Mm -hmm. At these temperatures, there's hardly any hydrogen per atom of nickel. So the concentration is very, very low. Well, you know that if the concentration is very, very low, the likelihood of anything happening has got to be low. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, on the surface, the concentration is high. So therefore, that's obviously where you look. I mean, you look for gold where the concentration of gold is high. You don't go mm -hmm. looking for it here on, you know, <laughs> like carpet. <laughs> so. Well, first of all, it, you have to have uh, something that will split the hydrogen molecule. And the hydrogen molecule, as a molecule, is inert. You have to split it into the atoms, and then you have to put the atoms into an environment that hides the Coulomb barrier around the nucleus. And then that structure that has done that, that has to move around until it finds another hydrogen that has and has experienced the same situation, and then they get together and they fuse. Or in the case of Rossi's case, they find a nickel and they go into the nickel nucleus and they turn it into copper. So you have to have something that splits. Now nickel does that. Nickel splits the bond. The more hydrogen you have, the more of these things you'll have, and therefore the faster the reaction. We know that. The higher the temperature, the faster these things are moving around, the faster they'll find one another. We know the temperature as it goes up improves things. Mm -hmm. So, but we don't know what it is that this atom, this nucleus, has to experience for its Coulomb barrier to be hidden. And we don't know what it's found when it's found it. All we know is that when it's found it, bingo, we get a nuclear reaction. From the point of view of there being more nickel than there is palladium, that, that's a good thing. On the other hand, the palladium that would be used in the uh, heavy hydrogen system isn't, doesn't disappear. I mean, yeah. it, and you don't need very much of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have used uh, it deposited in very, very thin layers on, on other materials. And so you, you don't really need solid pieces of it. When people have used solid pieces of it, all except for the last few microns of the surface are totally dead. There's, 
nothing's happening in there, you don't need that. So all you need is a few microns of palladium on something else. And, and I put a few microns of palladium oh. on platinum, and okay. it, it works just as well as a solid piece. So you don't need very much palladium, and the palladium that you do use never goes away. If the thing ever stops, you just melt it back down and re reform it. So it wasn't as if we were going to run out of palladium. Now, nickel's the same way. Now, nickel is being converted to copper, according to Rossi, so we're going to slowly use up our nickel and convert it to copper from that point of view. But that's a really slow process, mm -hmm. and copper is awfully useful anyway. There's probably dozens. I mean, we, we have, see, Hans and Fleischmann came along and they chose palladium, and there were some rational reasons for that. But it's probably not the best material. But because it worked, and people gained an understanding of it, they kept looking at it, and, mm -hmm. then, and they get more and more understanding, and so it pretty much focused on that. People came along and tried nickel, and it didn't work very often. It did occasionally, but not as often as deuterium and palladium did. So it encouraged people to continue to work in where the gold was located. You see, mm -hmm. once again, Rossi, on the other hand, for whatever reason, found that the light hydrogen nickel system worked, following the work of Piantelli, who had already explored and shown that that system was active. There were a number of other people in the United States who had also had some a little bit of success in using electrolytic systems instead of gas loading systems uh, of nickel. So, um, so, so there's a reason to believe that there was a little gold over there, but people really hadn't found very much of it. Well, he found a huge nugget. All right, so everybody starts running <laughs> to where he's found the nugget. And so we'll start looking at the nickel system. But who knows, other metals will probably work just as well. But nobody wants to, I mean, this is where the gold is. Yeah, there may be some over there, but, but it, we know it's here. Mm -hmm. So we'll wait to go over there after we mined it over here a bit. There are different nuclear reactions going on, this is true, but the mechanism that allows them to happen cannot be, there cannot be very many of them. If there were, it wouldn't be so difficult. If there were, uh, you know, the, the more ways in which nature has to do something, the easier it is to occur and the more often it occurs in nature. This occurs in nature very, very seldom. And it's very, very difficult to duplicate. So, therefore, it must be something fairly rare and therefore very unique. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, it says that nature really only has one way of doing this. And unless you have precisely that arrangement, that nuclear reactive environment, it's not going to happen. Okay. I don't think nature has more than one environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be a lot to expect for something so unusual as this to have a variety of ways in which it can happen. We're here in Kiva Labs with Dr. Edmund Storms at his workstation. Dr. Storms, can you explain what some of these devices are here? Well, this is a calorimeter in which I can heat uh, a sample up to 400 degrees centigrade in a hydrogen pressure. And while it's under those conditions, I can measure whether it's making any excess energy or not. And I can also detect any radiation that's coming out. So, this, this is um, the top of it. Unfortunately, it's somewhat um, crude, but it has down inside a, a vacuum door that protects the sample, uh, keeps the heat in so that it can be measured more precisely. It goes to a vacuum system that allows me to get down to very low pressures. Uh, this is a mass spectrometer here that allows measurement of helium and deuterium and hydrogen. Over here is another uh, vacuum port that goes to a system where I can prepare the sample. 
at high temperature under vacuum or pressure. And down here is a constant temperature bath that provides the reference temperature for the calorimeter. All calorimeters have to have a reference temperature that's constant, and, and, and that supplies it from the water that comes into the system. And then there's two power supplies over here that provide the power to the oven to heat it up. And then a computer that keeps track of what's going on and calculates whether or not there's any excess energy being produced. 